the the papers that you see on your desk, uh, we are not going to use those today, but I would ask that you would put those uh, in your notebook, uh, in your unit four. Put them in a safe place because we will be looking at these on Wednesday. We will be looking at these two papers on Wednesday. You don't have to do anything with them today, um, but like I said, on Wednesday, the papers on your desk, you will want to pull those out, and uh, we will look at these two papers on Wednesday. So for right now, just put them in a safe place in your notebook where you won't lose them, uh, and then we'll be good to go for those uh, on Wednesday. Also on the board, a couple things this week. This is what you're going to see all week. Uh, we do have a full week this week. Tomorrow I will be giving you your FRQ, um, so you'll have that a week ahead of time. Your FRQ is next Tuesday. Your Chapter 8 test is next Wednesday. <clears throat> and then your Pages in the Wood book. That is one thing I would recommend reading this week. Okay, there's not necessarily a due date, but it will help you in your understanding of political geography. So it's only 22 pages. Actually, it may be a page or two less than that. Um, I just put the vocab pages on there as well. So it may only be like 20 pages. I would highly recommend reading that. Um, it will definitely help you as you prepare uh, for your test next Wednesday. Okay? And keep in mind, yes, it's on Chapter 8 test next Wednesday, but there also are going to be questions from chapters 1 through 7. So I know we've had a little bit of a break, so don't forget that chapters 1 through 7 will be on that test as well. Alright, so you will have to go back and do some reviews. So the earlier you can start on your FRQ and studying for your test, the better. Okay, we want to start the third quarter off with couple positive scores next week, so next week will be an important uh, time there. Also keep in mind, this weekend you have a long weekend. I don't know if you realize that, uh, but Monday is a federal holiday. Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That is a national holiday, and so our schools close next Monday. So you do get a three-day weekend, uh, which is nice. Um, that's why our test is next Wednesday, the FRQ is next Tuesday. All right, so pretty light week this week in terms of homework because I want you putting in a lot of time on your chapter eight. I want you to do well on this test. It's a really positive thing for each of you if you can start out with an A or B or even a high C. would be really good on this test. Okay, questions for me? All right. Just so you kind of have an idea for the week, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, this uh, section, Key Issues 3 and 4, is a little bit longer. So we are going to be taking three days for that. Um, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, and Monday. Today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, we will be taking for this. Thursday in class, uh, you are going to be working on content posters. You will have the whole class time on Thursday to work on that. Um, and those will be due uh, on um, Friday morning. Um, we'll, and I'll tell you more about that on Thursday, but those will be due on Friday morning. You'll bring those to me before you start your first period. Uh, and then on Friday, we will go over your FRQ and have some review on Chapter 8 ahead of the weekend. Okay, so that's kind of the week at a glance uh, in AP Human Geography this week. Okay, let's, uh, let's dive in. we got a lot of good material to cover. Page 276, 277 in your book. If you would go ahead and open that with me. 276. 277. Uh, if you have a highlighter, I would ask that you keep that out. A couple things that I would like you to highlight here uh, right off the bat.
Uh, figure 8-25, if you would highlight that. We're going to talk a little bit about boundaries today. Um, if you would highlight figure 8-26, mountain boundaries. And then on the next page, if you would highlight figure 8-27, water boundaries. We're going to actually read the law of the sea at the bottom. Um, but if you want to put a star, it's kind of in yellow. It says the law of the sea. If you want to put a big star for this, by that, you need to know that for your AP exam. Okay, if you turn the page to page 278, page 279, um, if you would highlight figure 8-30, Talking about geometric boundaries, that's the drawing of straight lines. Also on page 279, if you would highlight figure 8-32. Sometimes boundaries are made by ethnic groups, which we're going to look at the island country of Cyprus. If you turn the page on page 280, You would highlight figure 8-33, shapes of states. There are a total of six uh, different shapes of countries in the world today. Um, on page 282 and 283, if you would highlight figure 8-34, regime type, we'll get into this probably a little bit tomorrow, autocratic, democratic, what those are, page 282, and then on page 283, you would highlight figure 8-36, Arab Spring. Okay, and the final thing here, um, actually there are several things, 284, 285, we're going to talk about the idea of gerrymandering, what gerrymandering is, and more than likely we'll get to this tomorrow, but you want to highlight at the bottom of page 284, uh, figure 8-37, 38, and 39. also want to highlight figure 8-41, gerrymandering in Nevada. Okay. So there's quite a bit in Key Issue 3 that you're highlighting, but I would recommend that as you're studying this week that you go back and read all of those. Um, pictures, maps that are highlighted um, because you will see questions, you very well could see questions on your test next Wednesday. All right, you ready to, to dive into this? What's, what's the question? Everyone highlight your question on, on key issue three. Um, Sarah, what's the, the question that we're looking at in key issue three? Why do boundaries cause problems? Okay, why do boundaries cause problems? Um, how many of you have traveled by car, not plane, but by car out of the state of Florida in the past couple of years? Okay, several of you have. Those of you that have traveled, maybe you've gone west out of Florida toward Alabama, maybe you've gone north out of Florida toward Georgia, have you noticed when you're leaving Florida, have you noticed if you look back as you're driving north or you're driving west, you look back, how many of you have seen the sign that says now entering Florida? As you've been driving out of Florida, you've looked back and you've seen the sign now entering Florida. 
Okay, a couple of you have. How many of you have noticed when you're driving north, you're driving west, you're going into Alabama or, or Georgia, those are the only two states that you can get to from Florida, you've noticed the sign that says, welcome to Georgia. Georgia's on your mind. Or welcome to Alabama. You've noticed those signs, right? That is signifying a boundary. Okay? You have just left one state and you are going to another state. Now, there are boundaries all over the world. We have lines on a map that show us where one country is and where another country is. But there are boundaries out there that are not so easy to decipher. For example, if you're on a boat in Lake Erie, and you're going from you're going from one side of the lake to the other. How do you know if you cross from one state into another? Or let's say that you're climbing a mountain. Okay, let's say you're in the Appalachian Mountains and you're hiking in the Appalachian Mountains. How do you know if you go from Tennessee into North Carolina? There's a boundary there. Is there an actual line that says Tennessee, North Carolina? No. You just have to know where you're at when it comes time to these boundaries. So boundaries exist all across the world today. Let's look at these first four. Okay. Logan, read for us the definition of boundary. An invisible, boundary. An invisible line that marks the extent of a state's territory. Okay, good. I like that. Very, that's our first key definition of this section here. Um, it separates a state from its neighbors. One thing that the state of Florida, the state of Georgia, the state of Alabama might not tell you, you know the actual boundary of the two states is not where you see the sign? I bet you didn't know that. Like, if you're driving north this summer on a vacation up to Atlanta to visit friends, and you're on 75 and you're driving up 75, and you get to that point where you see the sign, welcome to Georgia, Georgia's on your mind, and then like right past that sign you see the Georgia Welcome Center, what a lot of people don't realize is where that sign is, that isn't the actual boundary between Georgia and Florida. The boundary is actually several miles back. But they don't really put the sign right on the boundary, right? Okay, you would actually have to get out and kind of look around, and they're usually states have actual signs that say border Florida Georgia, okay, Florida Georgia line, actual sign. But they don't put that out on the highway. They just put the big welcome sign. A lot of people don't know that that's not the actual border. Um, okay. Cat, how about number two? Define physical boundary. Um, physical boundary coincided significant features of natural landscapes, mountains, oceans, or lakes. Okay. All right. Got to boost our energy this morning. Um, number three, cultural boundary. Steph? Follows the distribution of cultural characteristics and features towards a known unit. All right, this is, really, this is really important. I want you to highlight both of these. There are two types of boundaries, physical and cultural. Physical oftentimes is very easy. Okay, it's, it's very easy to decipher. Okay, for example, uh, physical boundary, you know mountains, oceans, deserts. If you were to take a boat ride uh, tomorrow, if you were to get on a, a private yacht Someone you know had a private yacht, and they said, you know what, let's take a boat ride down to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and let's go down to Cozumel for a couple days and go fishing. So you would get your boat off Fort Myers, and you would start um, going toward Mexico, okay? Now, at some point, okay, and we're going to read here in a moment about the law of the sea, at some point, you are going to leave the waters of the United States of America, and you are going to enter international waters. 
and you're going to be in international waters for a really long time, okay, over 100 miles. At some point, when you start getting closer to Mexico and you see land on the horizon, you're no longer in international waters. You're in Mexican waters. And you may even have the uh, Mexican Coast Guard. You may even have a Mexican um, boat of some sort come out and greet you and say, what are you doing here? Why are you in our waters? Okay, that is a physical boundary. Now, cultural boundaries, you have ethnic groups, you have religions, you have languages. We're going to get into with the country of Cyprus. If you vacation in the country of Cyprus, there are two very distinct cultural groups on that island. If you're on the north end and you're on the south end, you're going to be in two very different groups. And so in that regard, that country would be a cultural boundary because when you go from one side to the other, because their cultures are different, you're going to pick up on that. So boundaries look differently class around the world. Boundaries are not uniform. When you go from Florida to Georgia, do are people speaking a different language? Maybe a little different dialect. Maybe you know, the southern draw and things like that, it may be hard for you to understand, but, you know, they're still American. So boundaries look a lot different. Let's look at uh, number four here, and then we'll read the law of the sea. All right, highlight this for me. Deserts, they're permanent. Okay, you look at uh, the Sahara Desert. Okay, the Sahara Desert is the largest desert in the world in terms of land size. If you were trying to hike through the Sahara Desert, guess what? you would go through five or six countries. Are there going to be boundary lines as you're hiking through the Sahara Desert that say, hey, you're leaving Algeria, you're going into Libya, or you're leaving Libya, going into Egypt? No. But just understand that you are. Not really inhabited deserts, they're very difficult to cross. Okay, because of the temperature variation, the lack of resources, water, food. A lot of people don't hang out in deserts. Typically. All right, mountains, they're difficult to cross. They're sparsely inhabited. One of the big reasons people don't spend a lot of time on mountains is because of avalanches. I just saw over the weekend, sadly, out in Utah, there were a couple hikers that were hiking up in the mountains of Utah. An avalanche happened, killed one of the hikers. He had no chance. Okay, a lot of people are very leery of the mountains and staying in the mountains a whole lot because of the avalanches and how quickly they can happen and how devastating they can happen. That's why today they're sparsely inhabited. Okay, not a whole lot of people are going to live in the mountains because of the cold temperatures, the lack of resources. You know, think about it. Are you going to be able to farm in the mountains? No. Okay, so, and then water. Good protection against attacking the state. Um, let me just say this, in the world we live in today, the 21st century, 200 years ago, these boundaries were very effective at keeping the enemy away. Now, just because you have a desert between you and another country, or you have mountains between you and another country, or you have a big body of water between you and another country, it doesn't matter. I mean, when you think about North Korea has claimed to have nuclear weapons that can reach the west coast of the United States, what's between us and North Korea? It's called the Pacific Ocean, right? It's a pretty big body of water. So you have to understand these boundaries probably protected people a lot more 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The world we live in looks a lot different. And the enemies of the United States have a lot more access to trying to reach the United States. These boundaries aren't as secure in 2021 as maybe they were in 1921 or 1821. All right, let's read real quick, and you can highlight this if you want, the law of the sea. Rachel, would you read the first two paragraphs of that for us? All right. Some states have ocean boundaries and some do not. The ones that do are able to claim vast areas of the ocean for defense 
and to control a valuable fishing area. Beginning in the late 18th century, some states recognized the boundary known as the territorial limit, which exceeded three nautical miles from the shore into the ocean. Some states claimed more extensive territorial limits, and others identified a contiguous zone of influence that extended beyond the territorial limit. Good. Ginger, can you read that last paragraph? Sorry, I'm going to call all the seas. Yeah. Of all the seas signed by 158 countries have standardized the territorial limits for those countries at 12 nautical miles. Under the law of the sea, states also have exclusive rights to the fish and other marine life within 200 miles. Disputes can be taken to a tribunal for the law of the sea or to the International Court of Justice. Okay, which by the way, a lot of kids think, Mr. Crane, is there really like a court called the International Court of Justice and judges that sit on the law of the sea? Yes, there is. Okay, and it's through the United Nations. If you have an issue, if a country is coming into your territorial waters or they're fishing in waters that you have the first right to, you can uh, issue a formal complaint to this tribunal, uh, the International Court of Justice as it's called, and charges can be brought against that country. But I want you to look at this. I want you just to highlight where it says internal waters in this internal waters are anything that are within the country. So what would internal waters be within the United States? Just help me with that. I'm thinking of two big things. Kat? The Gulf of Mexico. Maybe the Gulf of Mexico on around the Gulf states, yes, but as you get toward the center, those are international waters. So the Gulf isn't necessarily, what I'm thinking of just because of time, what I'm thinking of is two things. How about rivers, right? Are rivers internal? For the most part, the, you think about the Mississippi River, the Colorado River, the Ohio River, um, the Allegheny River, all of those rivers are more internal. And then how about the Great Lakes? How about very large lakes? Those bodies of water would be internal. Take a look at territorial water. Okay, territorial waters extend for about 12 miles. If any country, I want to be very clear with this, if any country were to enter within those 12 nautical miles without authorization of the United States government, that would be viewed as an act of war. So if a Chinese nuclear submarine was found within 12 nautical miles off of the coast of Alaska, the United States would immediately issue a warning to the Chinese, get out of our waters or retaliation will be taken immediately. Countries take territorial waters very, very seriously. That is a very clear boundary on the global scene that people take very seriously. Then look at the contiguous zone. Okay, the contiguous zone, states may enforce laws uh, concerning pollution, taxation, customs, and immigration out to another 12 miles. So that next 12 miles, ships can come into that area, but they're monitored by the country. And then look at this. Okay, you have the exclusive economic zone 200 miles out, all right, exploiting national resources and fishing. So if the Chinese wanted to fish up to 200 miles off of California, even though it's not in the territorial waters, they would have to have permission from the United States because that's still viewed as waters in the economic interest of the United States. Last thing I want to point out, listen to me closely on this. Anything over 200 miles and out is considered international waters. So if you go 200 miles and out from any country in the world that sits on a body of water, okay, that is international waters. And at that point, anything can happen. Good, bad, anything in between. So this is really, really important. This actually could be a FRQ. On your AP. So you really want to make sure you understand 
this concept. This has been talked about as a possible uh, FRQ uh, in one of the upcoming AP exams. So something to think about. Okay, let's look at five and six. Okay, uh, number five. Uh, what types? What three types of cultural boundaries have often been used? Give an example of each type of boundary described. So. Cultural boundaries, number one, you may want to put a number one by this. You have geometric boundary. Okay, an example, north latitude line, 49th parallel separates the United States and Canada. So geometric lines, this is very precise. Okay, it's going to use lines of latitude, lines of longitude. It's going to use degrees of latitude, degrees of longitude. People don't talk like this today. For example, Jackson's not going to be talking to her friend in Canada and say, yeah, um, you're going to cross into the United States at the 49th parallel latitude. What? What are you talking about? We don't talk like that, but geometric is very specific. It uses uh, degrees of longitude and latitude. The second type of cultural boundary is a language boundary. A language boundary. Remember we talked about this when we talked about an isogloss and, and uh, dialects. Remember we talked about that in language chapter? Lines drawn between and around Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland after World War I, the Versailles Treaty. So based on languages, Okay, boundaries can be drawn. Religious boundary, lines that separate India and Pakistan, the Muslim. Remember we talked about that in chapter 7 with ethnicities. What were the two disputed areas on the border there between Pakistan and India? Jammu and Kashmir. Very good. Very good. Jammu and Kashmir. Those two areas are still disputed today in 2021. They're still bickering back and forth, the Muslims and the Hindus. All right, so certain boundaries are based on religion. This is a great case study. All right, I want you to put a star by number six or circle number six. This is a great example of cultural boundaries. Now, how many of you know where Cyprus is located? Where where exactly is it? I saw a cat's hand. It's like an island like right below Greece. Exactly. Very and, and what body of water, what body of water is Cyprus located in? It's a beautiful, beautiful body of water. Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean Sea. Let me just tell you, once all this COVID junk goes away and you're able to, as you get older, live your life, if you can ever take a cruise around the Mediterranean Sea, please do it. That's something that you know, my wife and I won't do it for a little while with COVID, but that's something have friends that have done it. It's one of the most beautiful bodies of water in the world. And it's, it's one of the largest seas in the world as well. Um, but Cyprus, yeah, very good. Cyprus is a very tiny island country in the middle of the Mediterranean. So why is it so unique? Well, one of the reasons it's so unique is it is a cultural boundary. Okay? It doesn't have a physical boundary. It has a cultural boundary. Um, who lives there? The Greek and the Turks. Okay, so the majority of the island is Greek, right, Logan? Minority of the island is Turkish. All right, so you have the Greeks and the Turks um, separated by a UN buffer. There's actually UN sanctioned troops from other countries that are along this border. The Greeks and the Turks don't like each other. Okay, the Turks are Muslim. Uh, the Greeks are more Eastern Orthodox. They speak different languages. They don't like each other that much. So the British have stepped in and helped. By, let me ask you this. I want to see if you pick up on this. Why are the British offering to help? Why would they care what happened on Cyprus? What do you think? I don't You're, you're headed down. What was one of the key words we talked about in issue two? And this will answer.
answer the question. Remember we talked about the word colonialism? What was Cyprus to Britain? They were colonies. So the British still have a vested interest in what goes on in Cyprus, because Cyprus used to be owned by Britain. So you have the Greeks have the largest part of the island. This would be more of the southern part of the island. More of the northern part of the island would be the Turks. Okay, And there's this little boundary here. And you see there's a military base. Um, the UN, there's kind of a buffer zone here. But there's a small military base that the British have on the Greek side so that they can monitor and there's not a civil war on this little island nation. Right? And there's this little boundary here where the British man that and make sure that there's no civil unrest. So, great, great example of a cultural boundary. All right, I'm going to move this up. You can go ahead and uh, this is the next thing. We're on page 280, 281 if, if you're following along. Um, shapes of states. This is one of my favorite ideas to think about. Do all states look the same? I mean, you look at the United States, right? Um, look at Florida. Isn't Florida a really unique state? I mean, when you think about it, do you know that from Key West, if you were driving from Key West to Pensacola, Florida, you wouldn't even left one state and you, will, you would have driven almost 12 hours. Wrap your mind around that. Florida is a huge state. Look at California. Look at how long California is. Look at Texas. Driving across Texas in one day, it takes the entire day. Eight to 10 hours doing that. But look at states like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware. Do you realize that you can make it all the way through the Northeast in almost one day? They're so tiny, and that's just in the United States. Have you ever noticed the shapes of states? I mean, think about Oklahoma, for example. Have you ever noticed on Oklahoma, it has that little narrow strip of Oklahoma that's really, really <coughs> tiny? Like, who lives in that little area? I don't know, maybe I'm just weird. I think about these things. Now, think about Hawaii. Hawaii is a state, but it's a bunch of islands. Could you live on an island? Would you become bored after a couple of years, or could you live your whole life on an island? I mean, think about these things. It's, it's really interesting. So we're going to get into this, give some examples, and then uh, hopefully on um, Wednesday we'll have more time to look at some examples. All right, compact. All right, greatest advantage. Good communications uh, can be established. Do you have this? Good communications can be established to all regions. Rwanda and Burundi, you might want to put in parentheses, that's in Africa. Generally, compact states are very small. They're very small. You're, they're easy to get around. Rwanda and Burundi are very small. If you want to keep this to the United States, a compact state would be Delaware. Okay, a compact state would be Rhode Island. Those are compact states. All right, elongated. You kind of figure that out. What does elongated mean? Longer, right? They're longer. They're going to be longer. Biggest problem with elongated states? Poor internal communications. Because they're so long, sometimes it's difficult to communicate from one end to the other, especially if you're talking about uh, countries with poor government. What are some examples of elongated states? Why well, I've given you a few. Again, these are in Africa. Malawi and Gambia. Can you give me any other examples of elongated states? This is in Africa, but there are other examples. Chile in South America. That's an awesome example. Chile in South America. Give you another good example of elongated would be Indonesia, right? Indonesia and Asia, these islands kind of spread out a little bit. Yeah. Malaysia. Malaysia, yep. 
that's in Asia, that's a little bit longer, very narrow country, very long. Um, so it's not just Africa, there are other examples out there. Prorupted, reason for prorupting the shape of a state, um, to provide a state with access to a resource or separate two states that would normally share a boundary. Um, you have Congo and Namibia. Actually, that should be Democratic Republic of Congo and Namibia. Now, um, if you look at page 280, real quick in your book, see if you could find the country of Namibia. It's at the bottom of the continent. It's on the left-hand side. Has everybody seen Namibia? All right, now I want you to notice I want you to notice, there's Namibia. Do you see Botswana and Zambia right beside it? Do you notice a little space in between Zambia and Botswana? There's like a little space there. What is that little space? That little space is the proruption. That little space is actually part of Namibia. Now, the question is, why in the world would they want that little proruption to go between Zambia and Botswana? Because there's a major river that flows through that part of southern Africa. And so they want to have access to that river because it's a channel for communication and it's a channel for transportation. And so you can see that very little narrow piece of land that juts in between those two other countries, that's the proruption. That's what a proruption looks like. Okay, very weird, but it's there. All right, perforated. How is the perforated state dependent on the perforatee? The import and export of goods is key. Look at South Africa. Find South Africa, okay? Does everybody see how South Africa at the tip? What is unique about South Africa that you notice very quickly? Kat? It has two internal states. It has two internal states. So South Africa would be the perforated state, which means it surrounds two internal states. In that way, you could look at uh, France. Monaco is a small country within France. You could look at Italy, Vatican City, San Marino are both internal states within a larger country. So that's where we get the idea of a perforated state. Okay? Keeping, keeping on, keeping on here. Let's look at um, this here. We have fragmented. All right, we have different kinds. States separated by water, states separated by another state. A um, good example of that would be Madagascar and Angola. Um, does everybody see Madagascar? On, on the map. Madagascar is very easy. What's what? It's separated by the Indian Ocean, right? Don't consider it a part of Africa, but the Indian Ocean separates that. Now, look, does everybody see the little inset of Angola? You see where it, it shows Angola? It's on the left-hand side. It, there's no color. And then you see where there's a little line that says Cabinda? part of Angola, and you notice how there's a little gap in between the main country of Ang Angola and that little part. You see how there's a little gap in between? So that part, Cabinda, is actually separate from Angola. Do you see that, Ginger? Okay, now I see it. Okay. Yeah, it's a really tiny part. In that way, that would be fragmented because it's still a part, Cabinda, that little part right on the Atlantic Ocean is still a part of Angola. It's just separate 
from the main country. Okay, um, Azerbaijan. We talked about Azerbaijan, right? They're fighting that civil war with the Georgians. That would be a fragmented state as well. All right, and this is the sixth, number eight. This is the sixth type of state, landlocked. So I want you just to put a number six and circle it above landlocked state. This is the sixth type of shape of state, okay? Um, it has no outlet to the sea because it's surrounded by other states. Okay, number nine. Um, Rachel, what'd you say? Where are most states of the world's landlocked states? In Africa. In Africa. We're, we're going to have a picture here momentarily. Number 10, why there? Logan? Why there? Because France and Great Britain set up colony regions, and over time, they became states. Okay, good. Very good. Talking about imperialism, colonialism. Um, number 11, what problems do landlocked states have? You want to put a star by this. Okay, number 11. Steph? Yeah, yeah, I mean, those, those are two huge things. It has trouble accessing seaports and receiving goods. It actually has to ask permission from other countries to get the goods to them, or they will fly it in. They'll have airstrips in the country, and they'll have to fly the goods in. They won't be able to get them directly off the boat. All right, so number 12, shade. This is the big... This is the big picture here um, that I had. These are the 15 countries. You can kind of check yourself. We have Botswana. These are the 15 countries in Africa. This is why Africa has the most landlocked countries in the world. Do you have these 15? Botswana, Burkina Faso, and I label them, Burundi, Central African Republic, Chad, Ethiopia, Lesotho, and I'll move it up here in a second, Malawi, very tiny little country here, Mali, which would be in northern Africa, uh, Niger, Rwanda, Swaziland, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So a total of 15. And you kind of get a good idea of where some of these are located. Okay, and I'm going to move that up so you can see. This kind of gives you, I tried to color them different colors, but this gives you an idea of the different states that are landlocked. Questions so far? Some of you colored them, did a great job. Some of you didn't color them. It's okay. All right. Number 13 through 16. Let's look at these. Number 13, Jackson, define democracy. Citizens, elect leaders, and convert to office. Okay. Does that sound like what we have in the United States? Very, very similar. We actually have something called a constitutional republic where everybody is under the constitution, but we also have a democracy. When you turn 18 years old, you'll be able to vote, and you will vote certain men and women into office, and they are your mouthpieces in Tallahassee on the state level or in Washington, D.C. on the federal level. Um, so. For all intents and purposes, we are a constitutional republic, but we also have democratic principles. How about autocracy? What is an autocracy, James? An autocracy is a government in which the uh, or in which the government is ruled by the interest of the ruler rather than the people. Yes, very good. What would be a good example of autocracy today? A couple of examples. Ginger? North Korea. North Korea, you can put that down. That would be an autocracy. What else? We've got a big one that we're, we're looking over. North Korea and, well, I guess you could say Russia. Yeah, Vladimir Putin rules it more like an, an autocracy. 
big one that I was thinking about, China. Right? China is another great example. They're very much in the law for sale. All right, Rachel, number 15 here. What are three areas democracies and autocracies differ? You want to highlight this, okay? You will see this again, I promise. Three areas that they differ. In the selection of leaders and the indictment. I can't read. Selection of leaders, citizen participation, and the idea of checks and balances. Okay, now, you understand for the most part how we select leaders in the United States, right? You know that you go out and vote, and you, you hope and pray that the voting is done legally, right? I'll just say, I'll, I'll leave that right there. You hope and pray that the voting is done legally and there's no shenanigans going on and that the person elected is the person elected, right? That's typically how you do it in a democratic society. Does anybody know how um, selecting a leader happens, for example, in North Korea or in China? Do they vote? There's no voting, first of all. In an autocracy, there's no voting. Ginger? Isn't it something where it's like either inherited or if it's passed down to like the next kind of leader? Absolutely, 100%. Those are the only ways. That's why there's such a push to have a son, because preferably they'd like to pass it on to a son. Now, sometimes they'll pass it on to a daughter, but they have to have offspring because they want to pass it down the line to keep it in the family. Or if they don't have that, then they will appoint another family member or a close ally to the family. But they never, in an autocracy, they never, ever ask for the people's input. Second thing, citizen participation. In a democracy, praise God, in three, four years, you'll be able to vote. Okay? Some of you in here may even be able to vote in the next presidential election in 2024, which will be in an autocracy, there's none of that. Um, the idea of checks and balances. I know you haven't had government yet. I know you had American history with Mr. Kiefer. Do you understand what checks and balances are? Is there anybody that understands that principle? Peyton, I see you shaking your head. What What is that real quick? It's like when a certain part of the government decides to check on the power level of someone else's or if they're using their power. Yeah, very quickly. What are the three main branches of our federal government? Three main branches, what are they? It, you don't have to raise your hand, just say them. Legislative. Executive. And judiciary. Judicial, okay? All, uh, based on our Constitution, all of those branches of government can supervise the other branches. For example, if President Trump or potentially incoming President Biden were to um, sign an executive order that was unconstitutional, the judicial branch can strike down that uh, executive order as unconstitutional. The executive branch nominates judges, so there's a check and balance. The legislative branch can override a president's veto. There's a check and balance, okay? All of that exists in the United States of America. In an autocracy, there's no check and balance. There's no checking each other. And finally, number 16, why has the world become more democratic? This is a great, great question. Sarah? The world has become more democratic because of replacement of monarchy, more citizens and government, and this nation has democracy. Yeah, very good. So people love freedom, okay? You have freedom within a democracy. Within an autocracy, you have no voice. You live under somebody's thumb. Who wants to live in a society like that? Like if, if not the United States, and you could pick a country that you would want to live in, I would hope that you would do your research to make sure that that country that you could live in outside the United States was democratic. I don't see anybody in the 20 years that I've taught and I've talked to kids about where would you live if it wasn't the United States. I've never had a student say, ooh, 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 I want to live in Iran. Ooh, ooh, I want to live in China. You know, or I want to live in North Korea. No one signs up willingly to go live in those type countries because there's no freedom. Freedom over here.
religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech, there's none of that. So that's why the world is becoming more and more democratic and, and, and we see that. All right, last question we'll do today uh, is number 17 and then we'll stop with number 17. Um, the Arab Spring. Arab Spring. I'll read this. If you want to update this, I would ask that you would. Um, this movement began in 2010. It reached its height in 2011. The Arab Spring consisted of protests in Southwest Asia and North Africa. So these are all Muslim controlled areas. You know what the Arab Spring really was? It was backlash against Muslim religion and Muslim policy. That's what it was. To the ousting of autocratic leaders in Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. The protests consisted of demonstrations, rallies, strikes, and other forms of civil disobedience. So because of young people rising up, they were able to throw out of power autocratic leaders in Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. Now, did the Arab Spring last forever? No, because the new leaders that came in crushed those rebellions. They crushed those demonstrations. So unfortunately, the Arab Spring was very, very short-lived. But it serves as a blueprint for the rest of the world when you have an oppressive government on how to rise up against them. Sometimes you do it, unfortunately, you do it by civil disobedience within the law, but other times you do it outside of the law. And I'll just leave this here as you're getting ready to go. You think about Antifa and what they've done across the country. Is that civil disobedience or is that violence? That's something that we could lead into tomorrow. Enjoy your lunch. Be safe this afternoon. Pick it up tomorrow.